Try not to let this world get you down. Try not to let this life get you down. Try to not let yourself get you down. I need everybody to forget about the troubles and worries from yesterday. Episodes. Plus, we're really excited to answer your questions. So make sure to buckle your seatbelts because the cars in London, they have seats that face backwards, double-decker buses, and they drive on the opposite side of the road. So what do you say? Let's keep this wild ride rolling. London will, will give you anything. It will mm. make your dream come true. You guys, the ancillary explorers just landed themselves this afternoon in front of the most iconic building in the entire United Kingdom, Buckingham Palace. It's right behind us. It's, it's where the queen lives, the royal family. But maybe what you didn't know is that this palace was actually built in 1705 by a gentleman by the name of the Duke of Buckingham. I mean, come on. If you build something that elaborate, you definitely have to name yourself after it. But it wasn't actually until 1856 that the very first queen moved in, Queen Victoria. And it actually set the precedent for every queen thus forward to take up residency here. The current queen reigning in the United Kingdom is Queen Elizabeth II, which is where she lives. And this is where she takes a lot of her legislative important duties and meetings that she has. One of my favorite things about this is there are over 775 rooms in Buckingham Palace. Not only that, but there's 760 windows. Do you know how long it has to, has to take to clean all of those? It's crazy. And the most amazing thing is that this beautiful palace has withstood the test of time. In World War II, the German military bombed not once, but seven times. And it's still standing today. I don't know if you remember our previous segment where we talked about parks. The Buckingham Palace is actually located in between two royal parks. And as we had said earlier, because the area around became so populated, that's why the more and more parks started popping up all over London.
actually protest is they do small groups all across the city so they therefore effectively shutting down almost the whole city and instead of doing huge protests with big groups they actually kind of form little pockets all throughout the city at main intersections you guys will see that from the other night the one that we covered they figured it out that's why it has been the consistent thing here in london to be able to kind of see and witness like what's going on right here is absolutely amazing and america take note please just witnessed one of London's protests firsthand. <laughs> know your rights. Know that you can peacefully assemble, you can voice your voice, you can express what you want to say. <laughs> Have that right in America. Let's use it. Why do they drink with their pinky up? No one knows how or why people started drinking tea with their pinky extended, but there are many myths surrounding how it started. One being that it was a way for a lady to discreetly and quietly point out in the room which suitor she wanted most. A suitor is a boy that she might have liked. Another myth? was that people in the olden days used to use their pinky and ring finger to pick their nose. Gross. That's why they extended it, because they wanted it to be the furthest away from their food and drink as possible. In modern day, people drink tea with their pinky extended as a sense of refinement. And quite honestly, just out of habit. There you go, and now you know. So when it comes to, to this, I, actually, I spend a lot of time in Parliament. So I work with a lot of MPs and Lords. Uh, last month we actually had a, a formal debate uh, in Parliament for 90 minutes. We've also had a new campaign, which is uh, a little bit like a resolution from America. It's called an EBM in the UK, okay. where we've had 47 MPs come out and sign. So this is Rob Gray talking to Abby Gray. Yes. Uh, so it's the, it's the Gray from the UK. <laughs> Uh, so it's Rob Gray, so R O B G R A Y. Okay. Um, uh, so like, I'm a, a Falun practitioner, I'm also the event organizer here. Uh, I've been doing the meditation practice for about 11 years. Okay. Uh, Falun Gong is a traditional Chinese meditation. Uh, it's a, what's called Qi Gong. So uh, Qi Gong is like an umbrella term for all different types of Tai Chi, um, yoga or Chinese meditation practices. Gotcha. So what these guys are here doing right now is actually the sit-in meditation. And with Falun Gong specifically, there was uh, in the 1990s, it was by far the most popular form of Qi Gong in China. There was somewhere in the region of about 70 to 100 million practitioners throughout China. So it means every morning throughout Shanghai in China, we've got in some of the leaflets that you can see here, you would have really had uh, sometimes hundreds, sometimes a couple of thousand people in the parks doing the exercises for half an hour, maybe an hour, hour and a half, and then going to work. Because China is a communist country, uh, anything that becomes too popular essentially is deemed as a threat. Now, in 1999, which is why we're actually here today, on April 25th, there was uh, uh, about 10,000 practitioners that went to do a peaceful demonstration in Beijing because a couple of hundred practitioners had been arrested. Now, uh, it was widely seen as one of the most peaceful demonstrations ever. During that process, the then president, Jiang Zemin, uh, had actually, it's quite documented, and he's spoken about this event. He drove around in a car, saw that there was such a large group of people, and then sent a memo to all the senior Communist Party officials to say that we need to eradicate Falun Gong, because he wasn't aware that so quickly such a 10,000 people 
uh, had come to do a peaceful demonstration. Now, when you have a, a nearly 100 million people in a country, 10,000 is actually not that much. Uh, there was no sort of structure to try and organise these. A lot of people had come from China, around China because they did, they'd heard about it in the news and they wanted to do something about it. Now, it was actually branded a cult, but in the same way, uh, the, the, the Christian Bible is called an illegal cult text unless it's edited by the Chinese Communist Party. The definition and the terminology of that in China is really propaganda. Now, from my own personal background, as I said, I also work for an NGO. Uh, I've done an awful lot of campaigning, both within the House of Parliament, which is quite close to here. I've also spent a lot of time within the European Parliament. I've done presentations on human rights in China uh, in both the UK and European Parliaments. Now, with these, um, there has been huge amounts of evidence since 2006, somewhere between 60 and 100,000 transplants per year. Uh, the, the belief is from the investigations that a large percentage of these, not absolutely, but a large percentage of these, is unwilling executed prisoners of conscience. There is something ongoing at the moment called China Tribunal. Uh, now, this is actually being chaired by somebody called Sir Geoffrey Nice, who is internationally regarded as an expert on genocide. Really, the evidence wow. connected to this is, is truly horrific. Wow, what a blessing our Constitution's First Amendment is. After coming across the Falun Gong protesters in Trafalgar Square and learning about some of the ways practitioners are punished in other countries, I'm amazed at the beauty of places like America and the UK, where freedom of and freedom from religion are valued as a basic human right. I can't imagine living in a place where believing in my religion or whatever I believe in was considered reason enough for the government to throw me in jail was founded in America actually by an American doctor called Dr. Torsten Trey. Um, it has medical professionals from all across America, Canada, Europe, Asia, South America. Uh, it's a, a, a global NGO and yeah. um, really they've come together. They also had the largest ever petition that was uh, presented to the United Nations of 3.2 million signatures. I think human rights as a the public speech, freedom of speech and to be able to, to demonstrate is, a, is an important uh, characteristic of human rights anywhere in the world, whether it's the US, Europe, the UK. Uh, I think the UK and the US have always been very traditional uh, in terms of being leaders of human rights. So, uh, you know, uh, we, I, I vote, actually voted to remain, to actually stay in the EU, but now we voted to leave. I think we need to just get on with it. Um, I think the, the case for asylum is really important. You know, I've actually, uh, there are several people here right now that have actually come into this country and that have had to apply for asylum. Yeah. And I think whether that's the UK, the US, um, when you have situations as stark as what I've just described as what's going into China, uh, it doesn't just become uh, a situation, it becomes a duty that you, yeah. have to, you have to stand up. And I think countries like the US, that's not going to change, I don't think. You know, something you'd like to say to them about? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, definitely, look, I, I, I've been helping to raise awareness about human rights in China for, for more than 10 years. I have unfortunately not got to know these things from newspapers or from TV. I've got to know these stories from looking people in the eyes and hearing their story. People like Rob are staging demonstrations like this, meeting with MPs, and even speaking to Parliament directly in hopes of freeing their fellow Falun Gong practitioners from the prisons some countries have against freely practicing the religion you choose. While religion is a valid reason for an asylum in a lot of countries, it's not always that easy. Rob knows this as someone who's been on the front lines in both parliament as well as on the picket line. The Founding Fathers were adamant about an appreciation for separation of church and state, so our laws and our government cannot dictate what free citizens worship or practice religiously. I'm starting to see how it's a blessing to not only have my rights, but to know my rights too. Dakota, fifth grade. Um, how many people are in London, England? One hmm. was been Big Ben made exactly. Over 8 million people live here. And you want to know what's even crazier? It is the ninth biggest city in the Look, world. Look, guys. It's the London Eye. <laughs> Can a 
started Friday drink tea with milk in it. Drinking your tea with milk is a tradition that dates all the way back to the 17th and 18th century. Back then, the china cups that they used were so delicate that if you poured the hot tea straight into the cup, it would crack and break, just like Chip from Beauty and the Beast. So to prevent that, they started placing a little bit of milk in the cup and then pouring tea. Also, another secret, when you add milk to the tea, it doesn't stay in the cup. There you go, and now you know. Do you know where we are right now? We're standing in front of the parliament building. And if you look up there, to my, what, what, what's up? That's, is that big bin that I see under construction? Hmm, I know we've all seen pictures of Big Ben in our history books, but the way you're seeing it right now, is the first time anyone's ever seen it this way. They're refurbishing it. But you want to know a really cool secret? That tower is actually not Big Ben. Yeah, no way. It's actually the Elizabeth Tower. It's actually the bell inside of the clock that's named Big Ben. Pretty interesting, right? And as you can see right now, they're reconstructing it. Now you know. Okay, you guys, this is crazy. So we found out that all through England and the UK, you have to actually receive the title of lady by the queen herself. She gives that to females, kind of similar to how men get knighted and you can become a knight here. Females become ladies. So if you want to have a savvy little hint, if you come to London, it's not acceptable to call a woman a lady if she is not given the title by the queen herself. All across the USA, we have ladies' rooms everywhere. We refer to women as ladies all the time. But here, it's actually not acceptable. So, be a little savvy on your trip to London. Laura, I'm in fifth grade. I really want to see London. Okay, let's get started. Does London have a Walmart? <laughs> How many food stores are in London? Anything that sells anything? Hmm, what a precocious question, Laura. Turns out, it's an American thing. Because, sadly, there are no Walmarts in London that we found. But, food stores and delicious restaurants are on almost every street corner. While visiting London, the comparable place to go shopping for food or groceries would be somewhere at a place called Tesco's or Sainsbury's. And speaking of stores, Better stock up on the British Pound, because those American dollars and coins will no longer work in the UK. That's what they call the underground. What is that again? The two. Okay, so did you guys know that they don't have candy here in the United Kingdom and in London? They have sweets. All candy is actually referred to as sweets. So if you're wanting like a sucker or anything like that, a lifesaver, you're gonna want a hard boiled sweet. Weird. They have sweets all over the place, but if you're wanting some candy, you're out of luck in London. I also love that everyone's having fun. Yeah, exactly. Because it looks like it's exactly. 